So these are really tough issues to wrestle with. We need everybody to speak out, so yes. What would we do differently? We have to start thinking further ahead. And we can do it, and we must do it. Our next speaker is Naomi Oreskes, and she is the author of Merchants of Doubt, How a Handful of Sciences, Scientists Obscure the Truth on the Issues from Tobacco to Global Warming. How many of you have read that book? Well, if, if you haven't read it, if you're only going to read one book on climate change, read that. If you're going to read two books on climate change, read Merchants of Doubt again. <laughs> It's, 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 um, it's alarming. It's meticulously written and researched. And she really opens up the machine of doubt, how it's been created, where all the dots connect. It's been very methodical over a long period of time. And she, and she is a historical, uh, a, a scientific, a scienti excuse me, a science historian. And she's a professor of history and science studies at the University of California. And, she's, and she is renowned internationally. This book has uh, informed The Inconvenient Truth and a variety of films and, and uh, in-depth studies on climate change. Please welcome Naomi Oreskes. Hello, thank you very much. Thanks uh, to Chip and Sally and everyone for inviting me. Thank you all for still being here on the last day of this meeting. So as everyone in this room knows, the United States is a signatory to the UN Framework Convention signed in 1992, which commits the world's nations to preventing dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system. And when the United States, but what many people have forgotten, of course, is that our first President Bush signed the Framework Convention, he called on world leaders to translate the written document into concrete action to protect the planet. What many people don't know, however, is that the UN Framework Convention was the culmination of more than 150 years of scientific research and investigation, beginning with the work of John Tyndall, who first established what it meant for something to be a greenhouse gas, through the work of Svante Arrhenius, who did the first calculations around 1900 of the impact of doubling CO2 in the atmosphere, Roger Revelle, the mentor to Al Gore, and of course Dave Keeling, who in 1958 began the systematic measurement of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which became the Keeling curve. This work was sufficiently well established by 1965 that it led President Lyndon Johnson to declare that our generation had altered the composition of the atmosphere on a global scale through a steady increase in carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels. By 1979, it had led the US National Academy of Sciences to declare that a plethora of studies from diverse sources indicates a consensus that climate changes will result from man's combustion of fossil fuels and changes in land use. And by the early 1990s, it had led to a general consensus among scientific research that that climate change, which had been predicted so long ago, was in fact underway, something which a consensus that I documented in my article in Science in 2004. So what we can say then is that by the early 2000s, the scientific evidence was sufficiently compelling that even many former contrarians and skeptics had come around. One of these was Frank Luntz, the Republican strategist, who in an interview in 2006 said, it's now 2006. So he was off to a good start. He got the year right. <laughs> I think most people would conclude that there is global warming taking place and that the behavior of humans is affecting the climate. Now, Luntz is important for our story because he was the author of a famous, some might say infamous, memo to Republican candidates running for office in 2003 in which he advised them to use the phrase climate change rather than global warming because he said, quote, climate change is a lot less frightening than global warming. In order to win the global warming debate, he advised, Republican candidates running for office should emphasize the scientific uncertainty and insist that there was no consensus. And he wrote, and all of the emphasis here is his, quote, the scientific debate remains open. Voters believe that there is no consensus about global warming within the scientific community. Should the public come to believe that the scientific issues are settled, their views about global warming will change accordingly. 
Therefore, you need to continue to make the lack of scientific certainty a primary issue in the political debate. Now, we can ask the question, was Luntz's position factually correct? No, the short answer is no. In 2001, the IPCC had declared unequivocally that human activities are modifying the concentration of atmospheric constituents that absorb or scatter radiant energy. Most of the observed warming over the last 50 years is likely to have been due to the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations. But of course, in fact, the science had actually coalesced earlier. In 1995, in the second assessment report, the IPCC had concluded that the balance of evidence suggests a discernible human impact on global climate. So what happened? Why didn't we take those concrete steps that our first President Bush promised us in the world? And how did scientific uncertainty come to be used as a political tool? Well, that is the story. Okay, next slide. Ah, okay, now I've gone, oh, now it's messed up, okay. That is the story that we tell in the book, the book that I wrote with my colleague Eric Conway, the story of a small group of scientists who exploited scientific uncertainty and promoted doubt, not just about climate change, but about a whole set of environmental issues in order to delay government action and prevent regulation. Okay, am I not pressing this hard enough or is there something wrong? Okay, what's that, put my foot on it? Is it? <laughs> now as all of you know, today doubt is about climate science is promoted in many quarters. But one of the most important players in this story, going back to 1988, is a think tank in, the, in Washington, D.C. called the George C. Marshall Institute. For many years, for more than 20 years, the Marshall Institute has either denied the reality of global warming or insisted that if there were warming that it was not caused by human activities, or most recently to insist that, well, even if it is happening, it's all fine and don't worry. So where did the Marshall Institute come from? And why have they promoted doubt about climate science? Well, the Marshall Institute was founded by these three men, all physicists who had built their careers during the Cold War in rocketry and weapons programs. On the left, Robert Jastrow, an astrophysicist and head of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, part of NASA. On the right, William Nuremberg, a nuclear physicist who had worked on the Manhattan Project, helped to build the atomic bomb, and the longtime director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where he supervised many Navy-sponsored programs on submarine marine acoustic detection and other related issues. And in the center, Frederick Seitz, a president, also a physicist, a solid-state physicist, who had worked with Eugene Wigner, considered one of the fathers of the atomic bomb, and a president of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. So all three very distinguished, all physicists, and all men who through their positions in the Cold War had served on many advisory panels uh, to various uh, generals, admirals, congressional committees, uh, and the White House. In the early 1980s, they found themselves working together on an advisory panel to the Reagan administration on SDI, strategic defense, or what most of us knew of as Star Wars. In 1984, they created the Marshall Institute to defend Star Wars on behalf of the Reagan administration against scientists' opposition to it. Many of you will remember that a majority of American scientists, in fact, 6,500 American scientists, signed a petition protesting the Star Wars program and pledging not to take funds from it. And also to promote the continued importance of science and technology in, in national defense, in part by insisting on the reality of Soviet strength and U.S. weakness. Now, at the same time, Frederick Seitz was also working as a consultant to the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Corporation. And as many of you know from the work of my colleagues like Alan Brandt and Robert Proctor, one of the principal strategies that the tobacco industry used to defend its product against the scientific evidence of its harms was doubt-mongering, to insist that the science was unsettled, that we didn't really know whether or not tobacco was harmful, and therefore it would be premature and inappropriate for the government to intervene. In 1989, these two activities merged. The Cold War ended. The Berlin Wall came down. The Soviet Union began to disintegrate. The West had won the Cold War. So we might have thought that these old Cold Warriors would be happy that their life's work had achieved the goal they had set for themselves. But they were not content. Instead, like old generals who can't put down their arms, they found a new enemy. And that new enemy was what they called environmental extremism, the exaggeration, they believed, of environmental threats by people with a left-wing political agenda. And they applied the tobacco strategy 
to insist that the science was unsettled. Doubt is our product, ran the infamous memo written by one tobacco industry executive in 1969, since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the minds of the general public. Well, these scientists supplied the doubt, but not just about the harms of tobacco, but also about the threat of nuclear winter, the reality of acid rain, the severity and causes of stratospheric ozone depletion, and the human causes of global warming. And there's also a kind of uh, rear guard revisionist attack on the science related to the harms of DDT. The physicists in this story cast doubt on all the science related to all of these issues and in every single case, in case after case after case over the course of more than two decades, continued to insist that the science was too uncertain to justify government action. Now to learn how they did it, you'll have to read the book, which will be on sale during the break. What I want to focus on for this audience is why they did it because I think this is tremendously important for us in getting past the doubt and moving forward into positive solutions to climate change. And also to speak a little bit today about why it gained so much traction, especially on the conservative side of the American political spectrum. The short answer is ideology, and specifically the ideology that George Soros has given the name free market fundamentalism. Free market fundamentalism is essentially an end member of a set of beliefs that fall into the category of modern neoliberalism, focused on releasing the so-called magic of the marketplace. It came to prominence in the 1980s, promoted by Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom and Ronald Reagan here in the United States. But, it's idea but it wasn't just conservatives. It wasn't just Tories and Republicans. It was also promoted in the United States uh, throughout the 1990s in the so-called Washington Consensus led by U.S. Democratic President Bill Clinton and U.K. labor leader Tony Blair. And indeed, I would argue that throughout the 1990s and 2000s, the neoliberal consensus dominated and had a, it was a bipartisan consensus in the United States, Europe, Canada, and Australia on the virtues of deregulation. Its intellectual roots can be found in the work of two key earlier thinkers who found their roots in World War II and the Cold War. One, Milton Friedman, the Chicago School economist, who in his seminal work, Capitalism and Freedom, argued that capitalism and freedom were inextricably linked. Because without free markets, we'd be on the road to, to tyranny, because in order to control markets, governments would have to control people. So protecting the freedom of the marketplace was crucial to preventing the rise of totalitarianism. Friedman himself was influenced by the work of the Austrian neoliberal economist Friedrich von Hayek and his seminal work, The Road to Serfdom, in which he opposed not only Soviet-style communism and totalitarianism, but even liberal Western European-style social democracy, fearing that it would put us on the road to serfdom. The contrarians in our story and the people who they began to work with over the next two decades, a network of think tanks and right-wing organizations, took this argument one step further, accusing environmentalism of being the slippery slope to socialism, the road to serfdom. Why? Well, because particularly in the 1980s and 90s, many environmentalists were arguing for government regulation. And from regulation of pollution that caused acid rain or secondhand smoke, they argued, it was only a small step towards government control of our lives more generally. This argument was articulated throughout contrarian writings, but perhaps most explicitly by a fourth physicist in our story, a man by the name of S. Fred Singer, well known to all people who have fought to defend climate science. Singer, like the others, was also a physicist. In fact, he was the proverbial rocket scientist. He was the first director of the U.S. National Weather Satellite Service. And like the others, was involved in campaigns to challenge the scientific evidence of acid rain, global warming, and ozone depletion. And like Fred Seitz, Fred Singer also defended tobacco. Working in the early 1990s with the Philip Morris Tobacco Company to attack the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency over the harms and regulation of secondhand smoke. In 1993, Singer worked with a lawyer named Kent Jeffries, who was affiliated with the Cato Institute and the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and wrote a report attacking the EPA over this issue. The EPA had declared secondhand smoke to be a Class A or proven carcinogen. This result was based on review of, of over 6,500 peer-reviewed scientific studies in oncology, epidemiology, and public health, health, and it had been affirmed by the U.S. Surgeon General and every major leading medical 
uh, society in the United States and overseas as well. The evidence was supported by diverse, independent, peer-reviewed studies in the United States, Europe, Japan, and elsewhere. So why would a rocket scientist challenge this scientific work? Indeed, why would any scientist challenge it? Well, Singer answered that question in his own words. If we do not carefully delineate the government's role in regulating dangers, he wrote, there is essentially no limit to how much government can ultimately control our lives. Throughout contrarian writings, we see then this anxiety that environmentalists are actually socialists and communists who want to control our lives. They refer to environmentalists as watermelons, green on the outside, red on the inside. George Will, who writes for the Washington Post, not normally considered to be a right-wing newspaper, has called environmentalism a green tree with red roots. And Senator James Inhofe, beloved to all of us, uh, has threatened to indict climate scientists for conspiracy to lie to Congress, has accused me personally of being part of the liberal conspiracy to bring down global capitalism, to which I reply that liberals should be so organized. <laughs> and so because we are socialists, they assert, we have a hidden agenda. And that hidden agenda is anti-business, anti-free market, and anti-technology. We really should invite Senator Inhofe to come to this meeting next year. So for example, when Fred Singer was attacking Sherry Rowland over the scientific evidence of the ozone hole, he wrote, and then there are probably those with hidden agendas of their own, not just to save the environment, but to change our economic system. Some of these coercive utopians are socialists, some are technology-hating Luddites, and most have a great desire to regulate on as large a scale as possible. The following year, he continued the argument, more dangerous still are those who have a hidden political agenda, most often oriented against business, the free market, and the capitalistic system. Of course, after the collapse of socialism, it is no longer fashionable to argue for state ownership of industrial concerns. The alternative is to control private firms by regulating every step of the manufacturing process. So what we see here then is that these, this, okay, thank you, these debates were not about the science. They were about governance and the role of government and specifically about regulation. They were about whether government should intervene in the marketplace to, pr to limit business activities and protect people from dangers, people and the environment from dangers. The merchandising of drought was not driven by principled concerns about scientific evidence, but by an ideological commitment to let's say fair economics the belief in an inextricable link between unrestricted capitalism and personal freedom and a hostility to regulation. A hostility born and nurtured in the Cold War, but that, that has lived on well past the times and the circumstances that inspired it. Now, of course, there are many ironies in the story, not least of which is that this accusation that environmentalism is a green tree with red roots is entirely false. As most of you probably know, the U.S. environmental movement has its roots not in the left-wing or labor politics of the early 20th century, but in the progressive republicanism of Teddy Roosevelt, Gifford Pinchot, and of course that famous communist John D. Rockefeller. Throughout the 1920s, right through the 1970s, there was a bipartisan political consensus in the United States on the importance of environmental protection, a c consensus that led to the passage of many major pieces of environmental protection legislation by large bipartisan uh, margins in Congress. But things began to change in the 1980s when scientific evidence began to reveal serious, important problems like acid rain, ozone depletion, and global warming, problems that seemed to demand some kind of government action, problems that seemed to demand regulation. And these issues emerged, and I think this is the historical confluence of events that it's so important for us to understand in terms of moving forward on this issue, is that by a piece of terrible historical bad luck, this scientific evidence emerged just as the moment that the Reagan administration was arguing for less government, less regulation, precisely as advocated by Milton Friedman, shown here shaking hands with the president. And this, I would argue, and we argue in our book, put the Reagan administration and then later the entire neoliberal consensus about deregulation on a collision course with science, on a collision course with our future. Now, Ronald Reagan may have had a point Government regulation is not the solution to every problem, and some environmentalists are socialists. But free market capitalism, like any human system, also has its limits. 
And those limits are what our economist colleagues call the negative externalities, costs that accrue to people who did not reap the benefits of the activities that generated them, costs that are not reflected in the price of goods and services. And environmental damage is the textbook case of a negative externality. And this, then, is the common thread that unites the otherwise rather inexplicably diverse set of issues that were challenged by the merchants of doubt. They were all examples of behaviors that generated large external costs and therefore provided a potential warrant for government intervention in the marketplace. It is for this reason that Nicholas Stern, the former chief economist of the World Bank, has called anthropogenic global warming the greatest and widest ranging market failure ever seen. The merchants of doubt sold the American people a bill of goods based on massive misrepresentation of scientific evidence. So in the minute I have remaining, oh, I have two minutes, even better, okay, I want to pose the question, why did we buy it? And I think the short answer is, and we obviously go into this in much more nuance and detail in the book, because we do fear regulation. We do fear loss of control of our lives. We do feel, fear over oppressive, oppressive or overwinning government. And we feel, fear climate change for the same reason, because we fear loss of control. Psychological research shows that we fear change in general because we equate change with loss. So what does this mean for our message? We had a lot of talk yesterday about what our message needs to be, and I have some thoughts on that, especially having spent a great deal of the last year on the road lecturing to very diverse audiences on this issue. I think it means that we have a very tough sell, that this is an extremely difficult issue because it is impossible to talk about climate change without talking about change, and therefore without talking about loss. But it also points to some ways forward. First, I think we should not use the word crisis because crisis conjures fear, anxiety, and even panic. But if instead we talk about climate change as a problem, a serious problem, but a problem, not a crisis, it offers the opportunity to develop positive images of problem solving, solving something the American people believe themselves to be rather good at. Similarly, I would not use the word collapse. Rather, I would talk about opportunities for transformation and for progress. And we all know that Americans do believe in progress. And finally, with all due respect to the beautiful Daryl Hannah, I don't think that this is about shifting the American dream. I think it is about sustaining and maintaining the American dream. I think it is all about keeping the American dream alive. Thank you very much. Oh, I had a cartoon at the end I wanted. That's not fair. Oh, well, anyway, uh, I have one minute for a question. <laughs> Yeah, Rick. Naomi, thanks. That's an excellent expose of, of how we've gotten here. How do you see this scientific uncertainty playing in the uh, presidential race emerging this year? How is it playing out in the politics of today? Well, I'm a historian. I don't make predictions. but. Um, well, Rick Perry is keeping me in business, you know. Um, yeah, well, I think we are seeing it playing out again. I mean, the trope of uncertainty is being used over and over and over again. And so I do think it's really important to be able to reframe that debate and say, look, this is not about scientific uncertainty. This is about how we move forward. Climate change is a serious problem, and we need to talk about how to solve that problem. Okay, well, I see the panelists are all lined up. So at this point, I think we can probably move forward. Thank you so much for being here today. So these are really tough issues to wrestle with. We need everybody to speak out, so yes. What would we do differently? We have to start thinking further ahead. And we can do it, and we must do it.